you in Hamlet or a sort of that kind of thing. Fundamentally alters the environment in an attempt to combat global warming. Would you please yeah. welcome our house A, Joe? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we are living in the midst of an economic crisis the likes of which the human race has never seen. We are living in a time where unless immediate and affirmative action is taken to combat the man and woman made destruction of the climate, we will have irreparable damage. But if climate engineering is a way to circumvent the political incentives that create the deadlock in which we find ourselves and save the earth for our and future generations. Our model is simple. We believe that non-governmental organizations such as Greenpeace, whose goals are environmental safe furtherance, uh, should support climate engineering, and they should support it in numerous ways. Firstly, they should lobby their governments to support international organizations that propose climate engineering. They should uh, fund awareness campaigns in the population to garner public support. They should do things like lobby international organizations like the United Nations, the Environmental Council, and they should continue to advocate for other parts of their environmental portfolio that put a substantial focus on climate engineering. We also think it is critically important that this advocacy be done with concerns for safety and sustainability for the environment. We would advocate for research and development and making sure that it's safe and sustainable. Uh, is it a clarification? No. Okay, safe and sustainable technology, have international bodies engage in the research as well, and have small scale testing of any sort of any sort of uh, policy before it's rolled out in the movement. So first I'd like to go over briefly what the goals of the environmental movements are. We think broadly speaking, the goals of environmental movements in the world are to save the planet from the man-made destruction of the environment. They are to prevent things like glaciers melting in the North Pole. They are to prevent things like flooding, threatening cities, creating island refugees, deforestation, and habitat loss for creatures. These are all pressing environmental needs that environmental movements seek to fight. There is a huge need for massive changes very soon, or else we will face irreparable damages. My first point of construction is that there is a current failure in the status quo to take the action that is necessary. We see that numerous attempts at international collaboration, which is right now the only way to gain meaningful climate change, have failed miserably. The Kyoto Accord has failed. The Copenhagen Accord and negotiations have failed. Countries have not met their, organ their obligation. They have not adhered to the goals that have been set out. And they are, in fact, adversarial towards each other in the process. Why is this? Firstly, because there is always going to be an incentive for countries to free ride in any kind of global coordinated effort to reduce environmental costs. That's because there are no enforcement mechanisms by which international organizations can hold countries accountable. The United States cannot compel China to the use of, say, sanctions to reduce their coal usage, and this is not a realistic outcome. For these reasons, they do not cooperate. Second, there's oftentimes a blame game in the climate change type of debate, where developing countries say the burden should not fall on us to reduce our emissions because the developed world, who has substantially greater riches, developed using the very same technology that we're using today. This often causes adversarial relationships and causes developing countries and developed countries not to adhere to their goals. Thirdly, there are strong political forces at play inside individual countries that advocate against sustainable environmental policies. These are things like extremely wealthy and influential resource extraction companies. These are things like big auto in the United States that lobbies against crackdowns on emissions and safety requirements. These are things like, uh, like uh, let's see, what else? Big business in general that likes to keep things uh, dirty and, uh, and worse for the environment. These are very powerful organizations with substantial resources, substantial funds that they use to lobby government to do this. So, uh, sure, go ahead. Surely the easiest way to just create the environment to do is to align it with the climate science, climate science section, which you guys prefer to espouse. Wouldn't that harm the movement of water health? Not if it is done sustainably, not if it is done safely, not if it is marketed well. We think that the benefits that this policy gives us are substantial, and it's an easy sell, and it circumvents all of the political mechanisms that would prevent progress that I just explained to you. Also, this solves the collective action problem that often happens when different countries are considering their levels of environmental protection. If you are a country who increases your environmental regulation, you run substantial risks of losing business in your country because it is now cheaper for multinational corporations to open factories in countries with lower environmental standards. This is why you get a sort of race to the bottom of environmental policies in developing countries that are looking to attract interest and investment in their countries. You do not have any of these problems with this kind of policy with climate engineering. This is my next point. Why does climate engineering exist outside of all of these political incentives, and why is it likely to work? Firstly, because it does not need sustained cooperation from an international conglomerate of countries. 
It does not matter if one country welches on their agreement, because all that you need is an NGO with substantial funds to do things like plant a large forest. You have a one-off injection of capital into the world that makes the world a better place. You do not see the necessity for a 15-year plan for China to dramatically change the way that it operates its company. Next, we think that these methods are often much less invasive to countries. You do not have to put demands on China, like completely changing its energy requirements to move away from coal, which it views as a critical economic lever for development in its country. You do not increase the costs of doing business for countries or businesses in those countries. So the business lobbies that so ardently rejected the Kyoto Accords have no incentive to oppose this kind of climate engineering. In fact, businesses and governments would likely support climate engineering in a way that they do not support cuts required by Kyoto. Why is this? Firstly, because it's excellent public relations for them. They're able to do things that take the heat off of them for being actors that destroy the environment. And they're able to do it in a way that does not affect their ability to do business, which is critically important. Secondly, this method wouldn't lose them money in the long term. If businesses and governments believe that through climate engineering, they can have, they can be okay with, say, using coal to power their factories, or they can be okay with having the sorts of environmental regulations that they have now, but still create a net good for the, for the environment, then they're much rather prefer that the focus on environmental development be in this very effective way. I think that for all of these reasons, governments cooperate to get better funding. Okay, so now what are the beneficial environmental effects that we can get here? They are substantial, and they are instant, and they are exactly what we need to avoid a complete environmental destruction of our planet. They are things like planting large-scale forests in areas that are currently barren that once perhaps held forest life. Areas that had been logged, areas that had once been the fertile environment for, say, many different types of species to live, you are able to, with this kind of policy, inject fertile ground and oxygen producing things in here. You're able to do things like clean our oceans and make them more efficient at producing carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Do things that create sustainable growth and sustainable environments that are healthy for marine biology like algae that help to reduce the amounts of emissions in the, in the Earth's atmosphere that cause all of the problems that we're talking about. Climate engineering has the capacity to be enormously beneficial to climate change, and it has the capacity to circumvent all of the political and social and economic incentives that currently exist that create a deadlock through which environmental change will never progress. We need to act now. We need to act firmly. Climate change is a problem that will not go away and will not be solved without dramatic means such as climate engineering. We are very proud to propose. Thank you for this fine speech. Now to open the case for awkward A, which please welcome like Josh. Well, you just heard one enormous assumption, which is that these projects are likely or even capable of actually reducing climate change. But the reality is that every single one we have tried and spent literally tens of billions of dollars in funding has failed. The algae bloom technology killed off all krill. The ability to make a satellite which reflect the sun enormously failed and cost tens of billions of dollars. This debate is about a trade-off. Should we lobby for money and efforts to reduce our emissions, to do things like build uh, the hydrogen car or make solar panels cheaper for everyone to adopt? Or we put our funding, or the environmental movement, lobby to put our funding instead into incredibly risky projects that cost billions and may never work. We tell you on side opposition that, that the option of funding projects which are more likely to work and smaller steps is the one that best addresses climate change. I will make two points. First, why it's unlikely to succeed and likely to cause enormous harm. And second, how we will destroy all political efforts made by the environmental movement and lead to an enormous backslide in this support. My case will respond if, to the, the case you've just heard. But first, just one issue of rebuttal, which was the sum of money involved. They told you it was just a one-off injection. You just put all the money into some NGO. The problem with that is that these types of initiatives take literally decades to develop. If I were to say to you how hard you think it is to develop
develop an all new type of enormous satellite that we put in, in outer space that will reflect an enormous amount of the sun, but still allow us to have all the light that we need to grow crops, you might think that is a very difficult endeavor. Every little component of that costs billions of dollars to produce. That type of thing is expensive. So the types of things we have to invest in are a whole range of different projects on that scale, each one costing billions of dollars. That is the problem for that side, is that we will, this expenditure we will outlay on this will be absolutely enormous and forgo all the other types of technologies which are far more likely to work. So let's talk about why this thing is likely to fail and cause harm. Often in debates, it's hard to make empirical claims. But we think if you look at the examples we're about to provide you and the analysis behind them, we will demonstrate these are unlikely to succeed and cause harm. So why are they likely to fail? <coughs> the problem is, it's very hard to create the entire world of every complex thing that goes on in our environment in a lab. Which means that when scientists look at their textbooks and look at their physics textbooks and plan out these technologies, they don't foresee the types of problems that they will in the future um, encounter. For instance, the idea of the reflective um, satellites that reflect, uh, reflect light away from the Earth, they thought it would be very easy to create types of cells by which light can come through enough to grow across, but filter out all the, the, the harmful um, UV radiation which creates a whole lot of global warming. The problem with that is that the creation of that type of cell was incredibly difficult. It was something that was literally a scientific impossibility. So although it showed a great amount of, of promise at the start, when we first decided to fund it, when someone put a proposal to someone somewhere, it ended up being something that was far too difficult. Again, when we released iron into the the Earth's waters, what we didn't realize was that it would kill a whole lot of sea life um, away, and that would actually stop up them being able to filter out the algae. So we killed up all the natural things which would have saved our world's oceans. We couldn't foresee that in the land because the world was so complicated. But the problem is that because we can't see those things and we're still putting all our money into them, we end up funding something that has a 1% chance of working in 30 years, rather than all the things we know will probably work. The fact that solar panels are getting cheaper and cheaper and more and more efficient. The fact that we can we are investing in finding ways to make nuclear waste more disposable and safer. All of those things have far shorter horizons and are far more likely. So when we talk about the environmental movement pressuring government, it should prefer the ones that those that had the likelihood of out getting outcomes and put all its billions there, rather than taking a lump long off risk or something that's unlikely to work. We think that trade-off is real in this debate. But it's not just a trade-off of failing, it's a trade-off of enormous harm. Let's take the example of the algae blooms in which we release iron-3 three, um, iron, three iron uh, into, the, into the ocean to kill off algae blooms. What we didn't know is that it interrupted with krill's feeding mechanisms. That was an enormous problem because it massively reduced the amount of krill in the world. At the same time, because fish feed on krill and whales feed on, 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 on fish, we killed off all, all, a lot of the world in, in the ways in case we tried this, a lot of the natural sea life that humans need in order to fish and make a living. So you can't predict as a scientist every single feeding mechanism and every single biological mechanism within every single animal of the ocean. That is something that's far too complex. But because all of those systems are so intertwined, even if you harm one of them, you end up destroying the environment in very unpredictable but very damaging ways. And that's important for the environmental movement, which speaks to me about protecting those types of creatures. We think it's abhorrent that Greenpeace would support an effort that ends up actually killing the whales. I'm pretty sure their slogan is saving the whales. Yeah. Yeah, 50 years ago, an electric car was a pipe dream, just like you're describing. The fact that something is <coughs> difficult to do doesn't mean there's not a worthwhile goal to fail. Also, we have the technology no, you to plant want. forests. Okay, okay. So, on that, right, 50 years ago, people thought that we would today be living in space in a moon colony. Colony. Uh, colony. That has not happened, right? It hasn't happened because the types of enormous like uh, aspirational goals that we thought would happen in scientists often don't happen. We get breakthroughs from things like the internet, which no one ever actually thought would occur. Science is very unusual in that it works out inventing things we wouldn't have imagined, but the long off dreams we did imagine often don't come to fruition. That point helped us. Why does it destroy all political effects? And we accept in this debate that the political change we would like to see hasn't come totally to fruition. But it must be accepted that in Australia, the EU, and New Zealand, countries like that all have cap and trade schemes and have all reduced their emissions. Slowly, we are seeing change. How does that side kill off all the awareness and political capital that governments don't face? Two ways. First, it's actually quite hard to convince people that they should forego their lifestyle in order to help something quite amorphous, like the environment, which will harm us in 10 years' time. That was a very difficult sell. So when you tell people, don't worry about how much you admit, admit because one day some scientist is going to fix all of our environmental problems, you get mass emissions. People start to do things like going back to driving hummers. 
people do things like stop voting for environmentalist parties. And what that means is that even though it's hard at the moment to get those type of cap and trade initiatives, you make it even harder because now the population actually supports you, they're unwilling to forgo their lifestyle. But on a second level, it erodes support from the people we need. Because there are people who are still concerned and think that environmental science is a load of bogus, right? It's nonsense. We need those people to come on board. But when you associate the environmental movement with science fiction and like today's you know, 2001 space oddity, you massively erode the support of those people. We say it's very easy for politicians in China to discredit the claims of the environmental movement when they're able to point to these ridiculous projects which environmentalists claim will solve the world. So not only do they not fix the problem, they make it worse because they stop all the political initiatives which we need to actually combat climate change. We shouldn't put our backing behind something that's unlikely to hurt and can do enormous harm. My speech, my speech, my speech, now teaching the case for government and the people are going to be. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What we just heard from the opening opposition was a piece that was filled with fear-mongering about the specific technology that me and Joe advocate, while incredibly thin on any alternative that the opposition actually supports, apart from constant allusions to backing other forces. The only one that we've heard alluded to in any detail was solar panels, and there's a number of reasons why they aren't the fix to the world environmental problem that I'm going to outline in depth, and why, comparatively speaking, the methods we're talking about are far more likely to work. Me and Joe think that the world today stands at a point of a structural incompatibility between the international system as it is constituted and the international cooperation we need to actually fix problems. This is the method that solves those. I want to talk to you about one more point of constructive about the current international regime about trying to fix environmental problems, why it has failed, why this fixes it, and then refute the opening opposition's case. There are currently 1,135 multilateral agreements on the environment and 1,375 bilateral agreements on the environment. I think what that points to is that the assumption that international cooperation will fix environmental problems and integration we're seeing is woefully misplaced. And it's structurally misplaced. It's not just a failure of political will. The reason it is can be seen in the example of the talks involving the upcoming climate conference in Peru. There is a discord in these conferences between what scientists say is needed to stop climate change reaching an irrevocable point and the actual agreements that get made. The reason for that is because if a need to build international consensus within these conferences, the ultimate treaties are almost always watered down from what scientists say is actually needed to stop the world from going into an irrevocable melting phase. Why does that matter? It means that even if those treaties are perfectly implemented by each and every country within them, they're structurally incapable of actually solving the problem of climate change in the way scientists say it is. And that's the best case scenario. As Joe tells you, in many cases, they aren't perfectly implemented. In many cases, there are strong incentives for countries to free ride and not allow the international community to enforce these kinds of policies on them. That's why I think there's a major problem with any alternative they're talking about. Because if they want to spread solar panels to the rest of the world, there's a massive discord between the kind of money available to spread it to the developing world and the amount of money needed to make it a sustainable technology. Further, at the point where their policies may not even be able to come into effect fast enough to stop the world from the tipping point at which any action is able to fix the amount of problems, their policy is structurally unsound. Ours ensures that even if there is an increased amount of time needed to develop climate engineering, that when it is implemented, it has the ability to launch far more broader and, uh, and wide-scale change than anything the opposition can do. Yeah. You know, it doesn't launch broad-scale change. It only addresses narrow issues that people target. Just dealing with increasing algae bloom doesn't deal with a host of issues that are coming from climate change. Yeah, so our case is not just about increased algae bloom. There's a number of various technologies about climate engineering, such as changing cloud cover, changing uh, the amount of forests we have in the world. I think, like, if you just pick one of those, it probably looks narrow. It would be entire breadth of climate engineering, I think, is rough. Yeah. Let's deal with what we're coming out, no thank you, of the opening opposition. The first thing they talk to us about is why these technologies have failed. That if algae bloom technology has killed lots of krill, and the attempt to reflect sunlight using satellites has not worked either. We have a number of responses to this. First, any of the alternatives that the opposition has alluded to in this debate would have suffered from the exact same problems they're talking about with climate engineering. 
They would have suffered from the problems in the case of solar panels of people standing up 20, 25 years ago and saying that they only work when uh, that there's no way to store power during off times when the sun isn't at its brightest, that they are too expensive to move on a wide stage. But ultimately what we'd say is more possible with climate engineering is that in the initial stages of the implementation of a technology, it is inevitable there will be some failures. What is important though, and our policy changes, is first the scale of money that is given to the initiative. I think the fact that it gets corporate backing very likely and more wide scale international backing makes it a far more concentrated effort than the initial efforts the opposition is worried about. But secondly, their alternatives are also fundamentally flawed. And I want to get into that now. They tell us that the alternatives they're talking about, such as solar panels, are far more likely to see proper change uh, as a result. No, thank you. I think there are a number of problems with this. First, those alternative technologies, such as solar, will be generous, we'll give them hydro and wind as well, we'll talk about that later, are opposed by current corporations with an incentive to not see the world economy move toward solar, hydro, or wind technology because most of their current investments are in oil. Here, here. That means that the kind of change we're talking about is most likely to get corporate backing because it doesn't need a fundamental restructuring of the technology that they're talking about. Second, the implementation of things like solar technology is incredibly regionally dependent. You can't enforce it in many countries that don't get consistent amount of sunlight or are under cloud cover for large periods of the year. Third, in many cases where there's organic movement towards solar panels getting better, the environmental movement can achieve those benefits in conjunction with the ones we are talking about as well. It's not clear why that's not true. So they then tell us that we can't foresee certain problems in a lab. First, I think that it is in many cases possible to do limited field tests for the kinds of technology we're talking about, especially in terms of uh, both implementing algae bloom technology and reflective technology. It is possible to implement it on a smaller scale before moving it for an increased period of time. But also, I think if they're going to talk about alternatives that they want that might increase the efficiency of other alternative forms of technology, they would suffer from similar problems of foreseeability, and even a perfectly implemented, like we've shown you, wouldn't be enough to fix the problems we're talking about. They then tell us that this is going to need more than a one-off injection of power. That it's going to be a sustained commitment over a long period of time. There are a number of reasons why I think it is still preferable to what the uh, status quo under their side of the house is. Because it is far more easy to monitor sustained con contributions to a research fund than it is to sustain and monitor how, many em how much emissions each country is emitting into the environment. First, because it is far more easy for developed countries to take the lead in injecting capital than it is for developing countries. This is something that richer countries have a disproportionate ability to contribute to, so, which makes it far more likely to be effective because it doesn't run into the responsibility problems that developing countries complain about in the status quo. It's also far more likely to have sustained capital investment by corporations and international organizations than their type of house. The last thing they talk about is political capital. They tell us that this crushes political capital to try and reduce emissions, this crushes political capital to try and fix the environment in other ways. I think our entire case for a large period of time has been that this political capital they're talking about doesn't exist. Joe gave you a number of reasons to believe that that political capital is simply non-existent because politicians in the developing world have an incentive to demonize governments who cooperate with international accords because it is seen as a tool of the West to scrap development. Because there's an inherent collective action problem for countries to have weak environmental regulations to attract international capital and multinational corporations. Because it is incredibly difficult to monitor or comply the kinds of treaties we're talking about. The political capital they believe exists is simply non-existent. Large-scale research and large-scale development of climate engineering remains the best hope the world has of overcoming the systemic problems in the international system that prevent cooperation and make the world a more perilous place to live for this generation and generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
and my beautiful fair green country was colonised. The ships brought over with them some rats. And like any good colonizer, the English decided the best way to get rid of the rats was to bring in stoats. There'd be no problems at all. There were stoats that target rats in England, they target rats in other places. Surely they'll target the rats in New Zealand, then they'll die out until the rats are gone because there's no more food for them. The big problem there is they didn't understand the New Zealand ecosystem. They didn't understand the terrifying effect that stoats had at the time that it had right through. It had on a glorious kiwi bird. I could go on very well about that. But the problem there is that we face a very similar situation with geoengineering, but on a world scale, because we can't effectively test these things in the lab or in small scale environments. We can't effectively predict the complexities of the effect they'll have, and that's why we shouldn't try and like basically continue on with the mistakes of the past and put our faith in some technological big fix, which we say carries with it more risk than reward, which we say harms the environmental movement itself because it stops in any kind of consensus around environmental movements happening. I have three points. The first is called this is a terrible idea. And I want to decide, uh, basically look through the practical elements and on balance decide whether it's more likely to get changed with uh, increasing cloud cover or whether you're more likely to carry on with the slow but positive consensus we're building now. Then I'm going to look at the effect on the environmental movement and look at how this undermines the impetus for anything. So at the moment when all the big corporate pile their money into studies to say, don't worry about our coal, we'll fix it in 50 years, and that doesn't work, then you're left in a much worse position. And finally, I want to look at building a consensus. Because the point we're suggesting huge global changes, we think it's a lot harder to get all countries to agree where it's going to have a differential impact on many of them, especially when you're talking about increasing cloud cover or changing the amount of sunlight, which has a massive effect on things like agricultural products. In terms of why this is a terrible idea, we told you that first of all it involves a lot of opportunity costs and very low reward. But secondly, we told you it was particularly risky. We told you that all of the attempts to do it so far had absolutely failed, and it's not a new science. We've been trying for 10 or 20 years. The responses we heard from them was that we can test it on a small scale. The first problem with this is they also categorized this as something that was immediate. It needed to happen before 10 years' time, or before 15 years' time. So the moment we have Great, like immediate pressures, and you sort of fear longer like they have about how uh, terrible the climate is at the moment. You start to pressure that testing to, to, to deliver results that it doesn't. But secondly, we deny the idea that small-scale testing of things like increasing cloud cover is able to deal with the complexities of the global environment, of all of the different effects that you have across wide-ranging seas and all sorts of different places. We think it's too hard to do it accurately. Yes, maybe you might be able to devise a test that has a 70% likelihood of showing you whether like, the iron stuff works or showing you whether all of the other engineering they have ideas they have there. But the second problem with that is it's not like electric cars. Because they keep saying, well, you know, we failed to build electric cars 15 years ago, we can do it now. Well, when you fail to build an electric car, it doesn't ruin the agricultural crops of Bangladesh or ruin the agricultural crops in Africa. But when you fight, when you test something, you think it works, and you apply it at a broad scale, and you send some NGO out to throw iron in the water, uh, at, at that point, we think that the risks to other people and to the environment are immense and are very, uh, <coughs> and are very uh, depressing. And that's why we think we're right to fear on that, because they've given us no reason why they can accurately implement these things and get over the particular risks that it has in the complex global environment. We think this creates a couple of harms that they then didn't engage with when they just told us it would be okay in 15 years and they'll fix it properly. The problem was with humans to start off with, because at the point you're disrupting weather patterns, so say increasing cloud cover or sending giant satellites up to try and reflect the rays of the sun there, it has a huge effect on agricultural seasons, a huge effect on all sorts of things which people currently rely on for their bread and their water and can have a huge harm there. But secondly, you have an immense backlash. So the point where a random United States NGO does, uh, dumps some kind of random substance in the middle of the ocean and changes the weather patterns, which particularly harm and hurt a small group of people somewhere else, there's a huge backlash both from private individuals and particularly that country against the action which has hurt them. But secondly, we told you it's bad for the environment. Something the environmental movement should care about more deeply than simply only caring about climate change. We told you it disrupts that in many ways. There wasn't that much engagement there. All they said in response to that was to fear under themselves and say the status quo is so broken and our analysis about our political and entrenched political corruption and those sorts of things is so powerful that absolutely nothing is going to save us except for this long shot, potentially extremely risky and destructive technology. We deny that. We think that we did have something we stood up for. Josh told you about how the environmental movement should continue to uh, support the policy of the Dutch, things that have proven and proven not to have huge and terribly uh, like risky effects on other people. But secondly, we think we have made gains. Barack Obama stood up at the G20 and talked about climate change. We think that there's been a broad, building a broad consensus slowly. And if you want to engage in that comparison about what we offer versus what you offer, yes, we probably can't get a treaty that completely solves climate change up to the level that climate scientists would like 
to return your climate to its like a, a premium condition. But we think we can get somewhere. We think those kind of changes can prevent climate change from getting as bad as it otherwise would be. And those sorts of things will make an impact on the lives of people in the future. But in comparison, if we're not achieving anything, then we think that you're in a much worse position. And even worse, if you are doing implement these kind of technologies and the risk boils over and you hurt people, you're even worse than that. We don't think you can overcome those sorts of problems by simply saying we can't this much go as better. Well, at the point where the trend of alternatives you advocate for are structurally capable of reaching the level that scientists talk about, the consequence of that failure is also crops being destroyed in Bangladesh, and which is the well, worst case scenario you pay for our side. We don't accept we the upside of the solution. We don't accept that there's a mm -hmm. magic tipping point before which everything's fine and after which everything's absolutely catastrophic. We think there's a general spectrum on which if we were, if we do take down some of our emissions at this point, even if we don't reach the point that scientists say we should do to make everything fine, you're still better off than if you did nothing. Why are you more likely to do nothing if you have this technology? We think, secondly, it plays on the human psyche when big businesses get behind the campaign to say, don't worry about our coal emissions, just like put your faith in the technology that might turn out to be good in 10 or 15 years. What if it doesn't? If we don't achieve those, and if the technology doesn't pay off, then at that point, we haven't done any of the other smaller things which we think are getting spilled at the moment because you've lost the impetus to make any of those changes. But secondly, you've looked at the impetus horizontally. We think you end up with a narrow focus on climate change or on emissions in one particular area and lose the focus on like, environmental standards in many other places. So the work we try and just simply increase cloud cover to, uh, to, to prevent the sun popping in. We think you still, you still get other um, environmental issues which are targeted. But secondly, why is it bad that big business is involved? They said, isn't it great that big businesses will get in and invest in all these studies? They have a massive incentive to invest in bogus studies that say this is very promising, wait five more years. So they can have five more years of guilt-free coal emission, and then five years later they invest in another bogus study to try and put the public to think it's just around the corner of the big fix, you don't have to worry about it. That's why we prefer slower and less effective change on this side of the house to effectively no change on that side of the house when it doesn't work. We don't think you can build a consensus, we think you create international issues when you have all of those sorts of risks being applied and you're proud to oppose. Hi, it's been with my speech, and now I'm moving it to closing government from Pennsylvania. Please welcome you, Deb. It's unfortunate that the front half refused to take our POIs because we could have actually taught them something particularly relevant about this round. That there are technologies that exist that are effective, that have already gone through all testing and can be employed right now. In fact, they are more cost effective than all of the things that they mentioned on their side of the house. So what will I do for you in this speech? First, I'll give you eight reasons why adaptation is insufficient and our model is actually better. Second of all, I will convince you that this is a try or die situation where unless we make the changes necessary, we will fail and face worse consequences than ever outrun on their side of the house. Next, I'm going to settle this issue of whether or not things exist. And fourthly, explain to you why cost rests on our side. So first of all, let's talk about adaptation. The first thing that you need to recognize is that there's certain things you just can't adapt to. For example, by the end of the century, it's expected that 82% of crop yields will have been reduced in most of the Arab world, right? You can't adapt to that little food, right? Similarly, things like cyclones, flooding, and hurricanes, destructions of areas, particularly religious sites and cultural sites that we see in places like Thailand, the Philippines, and Malaysia, right? I question how they're going to deal with that with solar panels, right? The crucial part here is furthermore that we've reached a tipping point. What does that mean? It means you've melted enough ice, for example, that ice is no longer there in sufficient quantities to reflect sunlight. That's called positive feedback. That means even if we stabilize emissions or stop them today, it gets worse and flooding continues. So their solution isn't even a solution to the fact that these problems now have a life of their own. Second of all, we're just more cost effective. What does this mean? So the IEA, the IPCC, and McKinsey conclude that stabilizing CO2 emissions through adaptation would actually have a net cost of about zero up to the point of 450 parts per million, which is huge, right? Net cost being zero in that you actually reduce more costly harms like things like floods that require things like dikes than you actually do spend on the technology. We think that that's damning to their side. They don't actually recognize that global warming would cost more than two world wars in the Great Depression, right? Like the facts that they can't stop simply by trying to mitigate them with solar panels are inevitably more expensive than what's on our side of the house. Next, when you talk about the kinds of technologies they use, those are also new. If you think about the kind of havoc wreaked by Hurricane Katrina because they've never seen a hurricane like that, 
Imagine the world facing a hurricane of a strength that we've never seen before. Those are the cases where you get human costs and personal costs that are too much. Third of all, it doesn't fix heat in the way that removing carbon fixes heat. What happens when you have heat? You have things like drought. You have the proliferation of any virus that transmits between mosquitoes, which particularly hurts the developing world. And also, quality of life just goes down in places that are already too hot to go outside. They don't deal with heat on their side of the house because they don't deal with carbon. Fourthly, we deal with pollution and emissions, which actually cause a lot of harms. If you're looking at places like China, where air quality is so shit, people actually get cancer at very young ages. I think that's important to recognize, too. Fifthly, recognize who we are. We are environmentally friendly people. We like animals. We believe in stewardship. They don't deal with the species that disappear in their world because you've adapted to rising heat, right? We're expecting millions more species at a rate that's unprecedented to go extinct. What that means for our side of the house is not only the fact that these, steward these stewardship supporters would be very unhappy, but another harm, you actually lose a lot in terms of biodiversity. Why is biodiversity important? We say that it actually leads to a lot of innovations, particularly for the environment and health. A Caribbean sponge was the reason we were able to find a solution that makes HIV no longer immediately fatal. $250 billion that were invested in studying the sex link of the, um, the, screwworm fly, the screwworm fly actually resulted in over 20 billion saved because we understood how to deal with pests that have been terrorizing crops in America forever. They are cost beneficial and they actually help us cure terrible, terrible diseases. They need to defend what happens when we lose the vast majority of species that we have not yet looked into. Now, the last idea I'd like to talk to you about is the fact that poor countries deal with the brunt of this harm, right? Because they can't afford to build things or invest in things like satellites, right? Especially in the long term where they have to make drastic changes due to things like drought, especially because they're the most likely to have to deal with conflict, right? For example, the Nile River is shared by Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Kenya, Tanzania. Like, that's the kind of place where you're going to see conflict violently erupt in ways that are irreparable in terms of human costs and political relationships. And once that happens, it's impossible for the international community to actually agree on things because they all hate each other. I'll take a few I can back out because you ignored me. Thank you. Okay, look, these sort of countries, what happens when one of these countries don't shoot into this river that may help their country but disproportionately impacts the countries down the line? You still have these problems. What do you mean dump shit into the river? We are on the side of intergenerational ethics, right? We help the future by reversing harms, right? At best, their side can slow harms that now perpetuate themselves. What we do, and I think that this is a crucial part of my speech, is that we actually start to reverse some of these things. How does this even work? Things like carbon sequestration or carbon cash, what they do is they remove carbon from the air. So what does that do? Something we didn't hear from front half. More sunlight is able to escape from the atmosphere when you have less of this carbon here. Heat is diffused, right? So it's actually spread out, not concentrated in areas where it causes more harm. You actually cool global temperatures altogether, stop a lot of the, p the positive feedback mechanisms that are, again, past tipping points like ice, and you're actually able to calibrate temperature appropriately based on where you remove it or areas that need it the most. That is huge. What are some of the mechanisms that work so far that we heard don't work? This isn't direct reputation. First of all, trees are important. I think the opening for telling us that trees exist. Artificial trees have completed all testing and are actually extremely effective as of a year ago. One fake tree costs pennies on the dollar and makes up for 100 hectares squared of forest loss. Please defend replacing forests because you've never told us why when it's as cheap as we said, it's not effective. Atmospheric dispersion has been very effective, something they seem to have not heard of. You make tiny um, detonations in the atmosphere that disperse carbon. It's shown to have no impact on the environment that could possibly be detrimental. Humans on our side. Seed capture. Again, thank you for telling us that algae exists. We're not even saying dumb iron in so you can forget that. There's actually artificial coral that's shown to have no impact, just like if you dump a piece of wood in the ocean, for example. And it's actually been extremely, extremely effective at reflecting some of these harms. Since these work, and I've already discussed that they're extremely important or beneficial in terms of cost, I think it's clear that our side is good. What they said is that we should use things like solar panels, and they didn't prove it was mutually exclusive, except to the extent that they said you'll have less political will, which I already think we heard doesn't exist to sufficient amount. That being said, the fact that it's try or die, the fact that a lot of developing countries are already feeling it, <coughs> means I think we have enough incentive. It could be risky, but so is investing in the first solar panel, right? Like The fact that the world is going to shit, I think, is enough of a reason to use everything in your arsenal, especially when the current system is not working. More importantly, since I've already explained that their alternative doesn't fix the problems that we're discussing and know about on our side of the house, I think you have to side with ours as the only solution to a lot of the problems I explained to you in my constructive. That accompanied with the fact that it's unfair and that it disproportionately hurts those countries that they've talked about who are most harmed. Asia, Africa, those countries that we've flooded that can't deal with massive drought. You can't wait for that kind of political agreement and you can't allow these problems to get worse. 
If you do, those times are surely worse than anything they could predict on their side of the house. That's why you wait. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I think the bulk of this debate has taken place around whether we can or cannot do this. Last time I want to extend today on the idea, or even if these mechanisms are effective, we think that companies and nations will cherry pick the ones they use to the detriment of the global as a whole. We want to talk about why the mechanisms involved can be used uh, for specific issues that will only benefit developed nations and companies on the line and not actually address many of the host of issues that come along with climate change. We think that's particularly harmful. I'm going to deal with some reputation first, and then I want to talk about the cherry picking point. So first, we get this idea of, of closing off. Like, look, this is really horrible. We really need to do something about this. There's a massive cost here. I think there's a few responses to this. So first, I think there are a number of things coming out of here that we don't address. They tell us that like, pollution is really important. So recognize you're saying, like, good, I can choose cloud cover. I think you lose a lot of allies and a lot of traction when you don't address the massive pollution coming out of China that is actually harming people. Recognize that those people, if they're impacted, may not have the solution for them be, we're going to fix the smog in China. The solution may be instead, we're going to impose some cloud cover that will stop us from, like, destroying uh, whatever these companies are. I think that's actually really harmful. Then they tell you, look, we have to protect, like, protect a lot of species. We're really great at protecting a lot of species. You know what you don't hear out of them? The fundamental aspect of conservation. Because recognize, I think first Gov tries to tell you, look guys, we're just replanting forests where they are. One, that is not in the info slide. The motion is fundamentally changing and planting forests where they were not before. So we are saying it is okay to plant forests in ecosystems where they did not exist. I think that screws with plants, so it's ecosystems that are incredibly fragile and species that may be there. Moreover, I think it further allows you to say, look, we're planting a forest over there. It doesn't matter if we tear down this rainforest, despite the very fragile species that may exist within there. I think that's fundamental change, and the fundamental change is the burden they must bear is what damages the ecosystems and what can harm species. What else do they tell us? Lastly, they tell us, look, guys, there's an aspect here of poor countries and the conflict. So two responses. So first, I think that the but poor countries may not have the finances or the necessary ability to make changes that we talk about in climate change engineering. I think the sort of investment will be used by developed countries to protect themselves and very location-specific aspects of climate change. That's actually incredibly harmful for developed countries. But second, none of what they tell us addresses the collective action problem issues. Recognize, if you think that you can put iron or some other form of chemical into your river and reduce the impact that will happen on your solar zone, you may disproportionately affect downstream waters. Also recognize their localized impacts don't happen in things like the ocean, where you can't have a localized impact. So it literally can affect all of this. Our understanding of these places is not the, is not in any way comprehensive. We know more about outer space than we do about the deep ocean. That's just fundamentally somewhere where I'm not okay with that. What do I want to talk about? Right. Uh, actually, I'll take a few others. Yeah, sure. But it's difficult to believe that the potential for harmful effects of gradually expanding field testing would be comparable to the harms on your side of unchecked pollution that the global community is structurally okay. incapable yeah. of solving. I actually don't think this is true. I think they've asserted this a lot. I think there was a major debate happening for this year. But moreover, I think our biggest emitter, China, has recently agreed to major pollution control. You know why? Because we have major allies that are coming out of this. So I think we actually lose a lot of the allies that would be really important. Things like local allies, such as Chinese people who don't want to have pollution impacting their personal health anymore. When you just deal with the impacts of it, you may come up with a climate change engineering solution that addresses the weather impacts of climate change, but not the pollution or impact on the individual thing. If it's totally fine to try to keep pumping out smoke, but somehow we've got a cloud power that fixes that, you don't address the impact on human health with climate change. I think that cherry-picking aspect is particularly harmful, and you lose local allies on the ground. I think you also lose allies of things like Brazilians in the rainforest when you say it's totally okay to cut down their forest, because guess what, we're fixing it somewhere else. Like, that's just a fundamental loss of allies. I also think you lose allies in terms of the WWF and conservation when you are willing to accept, because recognize that there is a crowding out mechanism here. As you push your emphasis on things like climate change engineering, you fundamentally are shifting both your funds and your attention to other aspects that you are making a shift in your priorities here, that you have, to a degree, given up on the ability to change the world's consumption pattern, which I primarily think needs to be the focus here. Just because we can try and innovate our way out of this, and Debbie will take you in a second, just because we can try and innovate our way out of this one, doesn't mean we have fixed the underlying issues of consumption that are screwing over our people. That is what is preventing us. And even if we 
we somehow create a shield or something along those lines, in 50 years from now, we are going to have to deal with the mountains of trash and the things we have polluted our environment with. The environmental movement needs to address the underlying cause of human harm to the planet. So logically, wouldn't you agree that it's possible and likely for environmentally friendly people to advocate for something cheap and effective at fixing the problem, while also not to, um, saying that you should perpetuate the problem by cutting down the forest? So I think it's a fundamental crowding out mechanism. So the first thing is a financing crowding out mechanism. And I want to talk about this chair of painting. So I think there's actually a really important element here that when you have a mass amount of things to choose from, whether it's ionization or whether or not it's shields or all of those, I think there is a cherry picking element. They also tell you, look, developed countries are now accountable to a research and development fund. You know what we did before? We did things like Norway putting millions and millions of dollars into not having Brazil cut down its rainforest or paying off Bangladesh to not use its peat bogs. Those sort of things are other aspects of actually preventing consumption instead of putting money into a theoretical research fund where you may get effects out of it. We have focused on tangible impacts to prevent consumption. I think the more effective thing is to have the developed world pay the developing world not to pollute. That's better. What we'll gets funded? I think that corporate interests here are going to be really excited about this, right, guys? They're going to want to fund things that impact their ability to not change their pattern, their ability to not stop using oil, their ability to keep pumping out carbon into the environment. That doesn't change the underlying consumption patterns in any meaningful way, and it also shifts corporate interests. This is an element of greenwashing. So it actually shifts the perception of how we view environmentalism. When I think like Chevy can tell me that it's totally environmental for me to drive a massive SUV because they're totally fighting this thing, I lose the ability to perceive what my consumption patterns are helping the environment, and people who want to be green and want to help the environment start buying into these mechanisms. That loses you political will for and support. It loses the meaningful impact of the environmental movement to say, you need to stop buying shit and filling up your environment. That loses out. But also, I think these sort of things crowd out the other policies in a meaningful sense, but also allow for selective cherry picking. Climate change is a massive problem. It does not have a unique individual effect. We've talked about simple, like massive, massive things from flooding to things like heat, all of these. Addressing only one of the problems of climate change does nothing to address the underlying causes of climate change. So when we see companies that are willing to fund something that does X, because it deals with heat, it's not dealing with things like flooding and the many other interrelated factors like pollution and all of these that also have a meaningful impact on climate change. Honorable Speaker, let's my stand stand that the environmental movement needs to take a firm stance on climate change. We have been effective at getting China to agree to pollution standards. We have been effective at promoting meaningful change. We need to stop this because climate change engineering will just be a cherry picking of things that only benefit the developed world. We stand proudly in opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This round was over the minute that closing opposition failed to address the thrust of Debbie's extension. Because there is a single reason that government wins this debate, and it's because of science. Let me be clear the current status quo and why opposition, in the best possible iteration, will never be able to deal with the problems. What do we tell you? First question that I would like to ask is the extent to which climate change needs to be solved. Now what we explain to you is that the tipping point for the Arctic ice to melt has already been passed. What does this mean in practice? That if from this day forward we do not emit any new carbon whatsoever, a host of devastating consequences will still occur because of the feedback loops that Debbie talks about, which means that the environmental degradation that you currently see will only continue to get worse. What happens if from this day forward we don't emit any new carbon? First, sea levels will rise. We tell you that entire nations will be submerged beneath the sea. Myanmar will drown and its people will flee from the country, but will be unable to find homes in other nearby regions for the simple reason that there is no space within that area. Second, we tell you that disease will ravage the world as the spread of malaria increases as a result of increased mosquito proliferation and other sort of atmospheric Third, we tell you that wars over water scarcity will annihilate the Middle East and create massive destabilization of regimes. This will result in their collapse into civil wars and outright anarchy. Fourth, we tell you that biodiversity lists the loss of keystone species, and if so much as one of those species, which is propping up the entire food chain, goes extinct, that can represent an existential threat to the entire human species. Fifth, we explain to you that insofar as you care about stopping climate change in general, we believe you as an activist should also care about the preservation of species. The response that we hear from the last speaker is that we are particularly good at conservation. 
I doubt on faith that in a world in which there is a four degree temperature increase, which fundamentally changes all of the environment, that polar bears will do particularly well in a world without a nor pole or any ice on the South Pole. That is not an adequate answer. Finally, we talked to you about poor countries. They say that this will be used uniquely by the rich, but they miss the thrust of the advocacy of the government bent, which is that the nature of these types of policies is such that even if it's only pursued by the wealthy nations, all nations around the world will be able to benefit from the decline in cart. What is the implication then? That it is simply unacceptable from a humanitarian and from any potential ethical standpoint to not do something about climate change. Why is this standing for their bench? Because all of the stuff that they talk about, about reducing future emissions, we explain to you is not enough. It is too late to simply implement solar panels. We do believe that they're important. However, and I'm going to get to you guys in just a little bit, the nature of the way that these types of cycles work and the tipping point, which has already been passed, is such that it is no longer enough to simply cut down. What we need to do is proactively reverse, and that is what we advocate for on our side of the house. This means that you are left in a try or die situation, insofar as you are not willing to accept the cost, then the only route to potential salvation for mankind is through the government's bench. None of all positions' advocacies are even functional. What do they try to make here? First, they explain that there is a high opportunity cost. We tell you that these alternatives are first, not exclusive, right? In fact, they need the working coordination for us to be able to get any sort of effective change. So yes, you could, for example, build a seawall to stop some of the impacts that already happened, but if water levels continue to rise through other additional problems, that's not an adequate answer. Yeah? If you want to run that argument, why don't you deal with all of our analysis and occupation? About how, and the opening government, about how they do become exclusive. And you divert people away from like, policy change on the ground towards these pie in the sky cloud covering. Okay, because there's two specific problems here. So the first of those, even if we granted every single thing your bench said, there is no possible world in which you're able to avert these consequences from happening, right? So the risks of like all these like political concerns are risks that we're simply going to need to bear. And more importantly, you as a climate activist should care about this because it's not acceptable for you to let hundreds of species go extinct, to let millions of individuals die as a result of climate change. They don't stop climate change on their house. That's the first problem. But also, let's deal specifically with the political incentives themselves. So these come primarily in two forms. First is sort of the diversion of political will from other groups. I think it's fundamentally implausible to believe that, for example, removing carbon from the atmosphere means that other individuals are going to be licensed to pollute. Probably there will still be political will for cutting down those and other sorts of avenues, and the government will still implement specific policies to be able to refrain this. We're fine also capping carbon emissions on our side. Moreover, some of the things that were specifically mentioned on the information slide are policies that are exactly the types of things that you're saying are so important. Things like, for example, reducing emissions as they come out of vehicles up front in order to be able to produce these types of goals. So I think the two are not fundamentally exclusive. The problem, though, is that when you don't have this particular side of trying to geoengineer in addition to everything that they get, then the problem is at best they are able to reduce further damage beyond a point. What we tell you though is that the point itself is unacceptable and already poses an existential threat to mankind. At that point, we do not believe that their option is acceptable. Also, they talk about finance crap. First, we believe that this assumes a fundamental loss of funds, which just simply isn't the case. So what happens is that individuals are going to continue wanting to do specific things to help their region in either side of the debate. The comparative difference, though, is that when we also push for geoengineering projects, we're able to create benefits that accrue to everybody, including the poorest countries. So for example, when the United States or another very wealthy nation plants a forest to reduce aggregate carbon emissions, that also helps people in less developed nations. That's a comparative analysis thing. They explain that adaptation is good, but they never mean if we deal with the comparative analysis that we give you first, which is to say that it's the ultimately like, cost effectiveness adds up to being no additional expenditure because of the additional cost that you'd see were you to not engage in this type of policy. But moreover, the problems that they're not able to solve on their side. So let's talk about pollution a little bit, right? They explain pollution is a huge problem. We explain that the types of ways of fixing pollution are also the types of things that allow you to reduce overall atmospheric pollution. So for example, like carbon capture methods are also effective at curbing pollution in these regions, which means that there are proactive political incentives that mean that individual nations will elect to enact this policy. At that point, we think the political will is there for reform. And what happens when it is? This takes me to the next area that I want to talk about, which is will geoengineering. We hear from opening opposition that it is hard to predict outcomes. We don't care if it is hard or not, because recognize that we are already geoengineering on their side of the house with carbon emissions that we are releasing. The question then is whether or not we try to do something to fix it. We are the only side of the house that does. 
They say that political will won't exist because of regional debt. We tell you that we are still able to effectively solve cooperation problems, and that unlikely that that is fundamentally unlikely that people will think that they can just like slack off in these situations. Again, we're fine with carbon caps and all that. They explain that there will be environmental damage, but they fail to explain how planting additional trees has a plausibility of causing serious harm. We know that carbon emissions are destructive in the status quo when we're doing something that only reduces carbon emissions. They needed to warn why that would be so harmful. Finally, we hear from closing government this leads to a loss of power. This is not warranted. So why will we be affected? We explain that we have a host of mechanisms to solve. There is forest, which we hear from opening, but the more effective alternative we think is artificial trees, which we get from Debbie, which are cost effective and are incredibly good at solving this problem. We explain to you there's also sea capture and all of these things. All of the science is on our side. Ban Ki Moon of the United Nations, the Rand Corporation McKinsey, there is no controversy. But remember, Mr. Speaker, that we do not have another choice. And at the point at which that's true, is the choice between outright destruction and at least a chance of hope on our side of the house versus none on theirs. We're so, so proud to propose. Thank you, Speaker. It's my speech, and now to move back to your place of opposition and place of the place at home. If you love to, Alexander. Mr. Speaker, I think Kathleen gives you the most salient analysis in this round when she tells you that fundamentally altering the environment using these technologies also fundamentally alters not only our interactions with each other on a global scale, but also with the agenda of the environmental movement by other parties. Fundamentally changing the environment changes the way we interact with this crisis in an irreversible way. Kathleen highlights for you a number of reasons why we don't get the forward movement that we want on this issue when we alter in this way and why this is a big problem. I have three questions. How does this affect the agenda of the environmental movement? Does this crowd out other methods of addressing climate change and why that might be an issue? And what kind of change do we actually get on either side of the house? On the first, changing the agenda. The reason change in the status quo is slow on environmental issues is because we are addressing more than one. There is the actual fact of global warming, but there are also the corollary issues of deforestation or consumptive lifestyles, which Kathleen touches on, that actually underlay all of the issues that we are talking about. The consumptive lifestyle and the sort of like destruction that we engage in as a species is the reason we have to engineer solutions in the first place, and government does absolutely nothing to address or eliminate that issue. What they do is put a band-aid on a bleeding, gaping hole of an issue on the face of the earth and tell you, wait 10 more years, it'll be okay. We think this is an issue for two different reasons that Kathleen highlights. One, this is a not in my backyard issue, right? So like a Western rich country with multiple corporations that have a vested interest in continuing to exploit the developing world for as long as they possibly can is going to be able now to say, don't worry, we did something about it. You won't have to worry about Bangladeshi refugees in India. You won't have to worry about flooding in the Philippines and assholes across the Pacific because we're putting algae in the water. And when they can do that, they can insulate themselves using the same kind of privilege that is the reason they are able to talk back to the developing world and shut down solutions that come out of that part of the earth. But second of all, Kathleen highlights for you that it's companies that get the benefit of this, right? Because where most of the money will come from, from this large capital investment that First Gov highlights for you, is that it's going to come from not the environmental lobby, not from progressive political will, because they told you on government that simply doesn't exist in a capacity to get that. But where the money is going to come from is companies that have an interest in using the environmental lobby to greenwash their agenda of continuing to exploit the earth and other people. I think Kathleen expands very well on what Front Off gives you when she tells you that lending your voice at the environmental movement to causes such as this gives you less political traction to push the agenda that has been given you, I'll take you in a second, further slow progress. Slow progress is okay, it is in fact progressing. In the status quo, companies already spend billions on greenwashing and cherry picking critical studies to change public perceptions on whether global warming exists at all. At least on our side, the money flows toward useful research, not discrediting environmentalism outright. Okay, so the reason that it doesn't work this way, and the reason that it will still discredit the environmental movement, is when inevitably there is some kind of issue, like too much iron downstream because you put it upstream in the river, or like an algae bloom that kills something you weren't expecting it to, or like an invasive species. 
species because transplanting the most effective carbon capturing tree into an environment it doesn't use actually screws with that environment on a large scale. When you inevitably screw up somehow, and you will because we always do, you get the environmental movement fully discredited for participating in what they said on that half dub was the salvation of mankind. Except now it isn't, and you have no recourse to politically lobby because you lent your voice to your opponents and their solutions. Second thing, does this crowd out other methods? And why is this an issue? Two issues here. Money. CG tells you that people can choose to do both things. I point you to the issue that the capital is no longer there, because the companies who could previously have sanctioned and said you are strip mining, plant me a forest, now are pouring all their money into this research, which may or may not turn out to do anything, so you can't corral the kinds of funds you used to be able to. Second of all, like, things like carbon capping and trading, just a note CG, are not actually that revolutionary, so they don't alter the environment fundamentally, but also, they work because we still want to keep polluting. The notion that Kathleen highlights for you is that we don't change our lifestyle at all when we engage in methods like that. That's why we've only had slow progress. Second issue, though, about why this addresses things and crowds them out is attention span. The public, Kathleen talks to you about this when she talks to you about the political will for these issues, which Brent Happ initially highlighted. The public is terrible at following multiple things, and they are even worse at committing themselves to a nebulous cause when little action is required on their part, as it will be when you can point to a solution and say someone else with lots of money and power is doing something about it. No one in Indonesia chooses to stop burning down rubber plantations and forests that pollute Malaysia because we can't fix how the wind works. When you tell them, well, it's add cloud cover, acid rain becomes an issue when you do things like that. There are a host of environmental issues that actually come out of the solutions they propose to engineer on their side of the house. I think it's ridiculous to support that and claim that it's forward motion, Debbie. Right, so even if all of the harms you mentioned happen, right, so people continue to emit, continue to have emission-related problems, the fact that we capture carbon and produce a lot of these problems still makes our side better off, no? Okay, so the issue, and the reason why Debbie's analysis loses out to Kathleen's analysis, and why slow progress is actually fine, is because slow progress is something that fits within the adaptive cycle of the Earth. We have been doing it for a long time. What Debbie is saying is that there is nothing but awful change on our side of the house. In fact, the slowing down of things is quite okay. The adaptations that they present on their side of the house don't necessarily solve. And when you have issues like the ones presented with conflict over climate, that is heightened when you don't interfere with companies doing the kinds of exploitation and consumptive living that is still okay on their side of the house. Lastly, what kind of change actually occurs? I tell you that there are only two, and Kathleen speaks best about them. There is incidental change on the most PR-friendly issues. This is a huge thrust in her extension where she tells you about the insulatory privilege afforded by money in the groups that have the capital to do the kind of injection First Gov says is necessary. But if you choose to buy more into the scheme that we have passed the tipping point, then it's okay, this is the critical moment. Why is that the case? Because the patterns that have led to every instantiation of warming on our planet are underlaid by a lifestyle that you lose the momentum to prevent when you tell them we have engineered our way out of the life we chose to live. Kathleen tells you that the full sense of security we've been living on for the last 200 years isn't going to last for even half another century. The only option is to let disaster strike so that we can tell people we've done something wrong. It's time to fix it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for supporting Nancy Green.